QuickBooks Desktop 2023 Balance Sheet Report Overview. Let's do it within two its QuickBooks Desktop 2023. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Here we are in QuickBooks Desktop Sample Rock Castle Construction Practice File provided by QuickBooks going through the setup process we do every time. Maximizing the home page to the gray area, going to the view dropdown, noting that we have the hide icon bar and open windows lists checked off. Open windows on the left hand side, opening up the major two financial statement reports, reports drop down, company and financial, the profit and loss. Let's start out with tab for the date range change 0101241231 tab, January through December, customizing it so I can go to the fonts and numbers and change it to 12. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Then Reports drop down again, company and financial, this time the big balance sheet tab for the date 123124, customizing it up top, going to the fonts and numbers, changing the font size to 12, okay, yes please, and okay. Now that's the thing, that's the setup process we've been doing every time, noting that every time we work on anything, we've been opening up the major two financial statement reports, that being the balance sheet and the income statement, because those are the reports that we're primarily constructing. Those are the end result, that's the goal, that's what the accounting process is aimed at creating. Every time we enter something, for example, in the home page, we are typically entering something that will have an impact on at least two accounts on the major financial statement reports in accordance with the double entry accounting system, that being the balance sheet and the income statement. Our focus now will be on the balance sheet so we can break that down in more detail, get a better understanding of it. So to do that, I'm gonna open up a few more things here. I wanna open up the the general ledger. I'm gonna to go to the list drop, I'm sorry, the chart of accounts, list drop down, and then the chart of accounts, which we've looked at in a prior presentations. This is the baseline accounts that we need in order to set up the data input forms in order to create the end results with them, the balance sheet and the income statement. And so you can notice that the top half of this is in essence balance sheet accounts because it's in order by type, assets, liabilities, equity, then income and expenses as we talked about in a prior presentation. We'll look at that in more detail here. The other report I think is useful to understand is the trial balance. So I'm gonna to go to the reports drop down. We're gonna to go to the accounting and taxes for this one and look at the trial balance. This is in essence the balance sheet on top of the income statement, date range change. 12, this is going to be from 010124 to 123124. I'm going to customize that report. Fonts and numbers, changing the font on up to 12. Okay, yes, and okay. I want to have this one kind of in the back of our mind because it's a useful report to kind of verify your data input when you start getting a better feel for things because you can look at the balance sheet and income statement in one place with less uh, subtotals. It's a shorter, more streamlined report. Okay, that being said, let's go back to the balance sheet. We're going to basically go through this kind of line by line here and try to understand how it's being constructed and possibly a little bit of why it's being constructed. To do so, I'm going to make all these little carrots from the inside out. I'm going to collapse them. And so also note, you could start with like a summary balance sheet. There is a report for a summary balance sheet, which in essence collapses these items. But for internal use, it's useful to use the, the standard balance sheet because it has all the accounts in it, which, which is often useful when we're trying to drill down on things, even though it's a little bit longer of a report. I'm gonna make this minimize. I'm gonna go from the inside out here, 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 
and here and then here and then here okay and then here well hold on a second there so <laughs> there we go okay as it so there's everything and then I could do this for the last one so notice that the balance sheet is going to be as of a point in time so that's going to be the first thing we want to note here there's no date range you may have noticed every time i enter the data you might say why do they only give us one date up top instead of a date range that's because the balance sheet is as of a point in time if i have it as of 12 31 2024 it wouldn't matter if the date range was december 1st through December 31st, 2024, or January 1st through December 31st, 2024, or January of 2022 through December 31st, 2024, because this report is reported as of the end date, the last date, a point in time, that typically being the end of the year or the end of the month. That being different than the profit and loss report, as you can see here, which has the date range up top, income represents income that has been generated over a time range you have to have a range you have to have a year versus a month a month is going to have less income in an income account than a year if i go to the balance sheet there's no difference between a month and a year it's just where you stand at the end of that point in time so that's the first thing uh to get to get a handle on the next thing is just to understand, I'm going to make this minimize, is that the balance sheet is in essence the accounting equation. So when we think about the double entry accounting system, we can think of it in terms of uh, debits and credits, or you can think of it in terms of the accounting equation. The balance sheet is the accounting equation where we have assets equal liabilities and equity. Assets represent what the company has. We're going to represent those assets, try to value them in cash, of course, in dollars. That's our measuring tool. The liabilities and equity represent who has claim to those assets, meaning liability has third party claims to the assets, like a bank has claims to our assets for a loan or something. And then equity is the owner's claim, whether that be sole proprietor one owner partnership multiple owners corporations the shareholders could have different names for the equity but the equity is ownership you can also think of this equation as assets minus liabilities equals equity which is why equities are kind of like the net value of the company to the owner right that's kind of if you were to liquidate the company in theory you'd sell the assets pay off the liabilities the difference would go to the owners the equity the value of it Okay, so now let's open this up piece by piece. And I'll try to note to a little bit of some of the differences in QuickBooks and why from financial accounting generally and why those differences are kind of there usually technical issues. So notice that assets is of course, a class that would be there on any financial statement reporting, current assets will be there in any current financial statement reporting because you have to compare the assets that are going to be more liquid meaning those that are going to be used sooner consumed sooner and typically can be consumed and used in order to help generate cash that can be used to pay off liabilities that are coming due shortly therefore that's a common you know financial accounting term then you've got these subcategories under it checking account accounts receivable other assets it's not normal to have these other kind of subcategories oftentimes for normal financial accounting. In other words, the checking accounts we would just record as cash and cash equivalents under normal financial statement reporting typically. And accounts receivable doesn't need a subcategory because there's only one account for it. We might have an allowance where we have a subcategory, but it's a little bit unusual to have a subcategory for accounts receivable and then everything else is in this other normally we wouldn't need an other current assets because they would all just be under the category of current assets the reason quickbooks has these subcategories is because of a technical reason uh, off in general if you go to the chart of accounts as we've talked about when we looked at the chart of accounts the cash accounts need its own subcategory because they have special needs in the functionality within quickbooks such as connecting to the bank feeds the accounts receivable has a special need in terms of how the account functions in that we need to track it by the sub ledger of the uh, customers, customer receivables, and then everything else is in the subcategory of current assets that doesn't have a special need. That's why you have those three categories. Everything that has a different type 
is going to have the drop down when you look at the standard balance sheet. If I go back to the balance sheet, that's where these drop downs are coming from. So if I go in, or these drop downs. So if I go into the cash accounts, then everything that's labeled as a cash account, which would include things like the checking account, the saving account and petty cash. These are things that typically you might be able to connect to the bank will be here. So we have those items. And these are the accounts that are going to have the most activity if you double click on them because cash or 10124 has has is is involved in every cycle. So you have more types of accounts in the cash account than any other account that we will see. Closing that back out, then you've got the accounts receivable. That represents money that's owed to us from customers. It would only be there if we're on an accrual basis for the for the cash for the revenue cycle. In other words, if I go to the home page, we'd have to be creating an invoice in order to build the client for work that has been done instead of just recording revenue with a deposit or with a sales receipt. Because that means that we did the work first, they owe us money, and therefore we got to track the receivable. So this invoice is the thing that creates on the balance sheet the accounts receivable. We're also going to need a sub ledger for the receivable as we've seen in the past, breaking it out not just by date, as we see here, which is basically a general ledger account. Every, every account has this general ledger by date, but we also need to have it broken out by, this. they call it a transaction report, but it's basically a GL account general ledger. But we also have to break it out by uh, who owes us the money. That's why it has that special need. And then we've got the other current assets, which has everything else that would be defined as a current asset. The funniest thing here, the weirdest thing is this undeposited funds, which that represents money that we have collected from customers, but have not yet put into a bank. And so if you look at the home page, we saw that that could happen here when we receive payments, it could happen here. And the reason we have that is because we want to be able to group the deposits in a clearing account, undeposited funds, before putting it into the checking account in the same grouping that we expect it to be shown on the, the bank statement as so we can reconcile as easily as possible. The funny thing about this, however, is you would think it would still be a cash type of account. And therefore, for normal reporting purposes, you probably would want it up here in like the cash accounts, but it's not actually a checking account. So it works functionality wise, kind of like an other current asset account. So they put it down here from a functionality standpoint. So keep that in mind because that can throw things off when you compare things to like the, uh, the 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 statement of cash flows and things like that so uh and so that's that we got inventory inventory would only be there if we're actually selling inventory clearly and so we're tracking the inventory that we purchased that we have not yet sold when we sell it we're going to be taking it out of inventory and recording it in cost of goods sold this is also kind of an accrual type of account because tracking inventory is an accrual thing that we are doing we're, we're not just expensing the inventory when we buy it we're putting on the books as an asset then we've got the employee advances for payroll stuff prepaid tax uh prepaid insurance so we'll talk more about prepayments in future presentations but anytime you you pay a large lump sum for expenses up front then you on an accrual basis you could have want to record them as a prepayment so that you can expense them when you consume them as opposed to just simply when you pay for them and that makes better comparisons on the income statement. So there's our total current assets that we have here. Then we have the fixed assets. Oftentimes they might be called, you might hear this category called property, plant and equipment or depreciable assets. And this is kind of a, a form of prepaid insurance. It's the most extreme form that people are most familiar with. In other words, you might say, hey, I'm on a cash basis type of system. But even if you're on a cash based type of system, you're going to have to use some accrual concepts when it becomes so extreme that it just makes sense to do so. So, for example, if you bought a building, an office building for one hundred thousand dollars, even if you paid cash for it, you probably wouldn't want to expense it just in one year because that would distort your income statement. If I went to my income statement and tried to compare this year compared to the last year and I bought a $100,000 building with cash this year, then that would make it look like one year was way worse than the other year, but it's just because I bought a office building and expensed it all in one year. 
that's way extreme. And therefore, for better comparable purposes, the idea would be from an accrual standpoint, you put it on the books as an asset, and then you depreciate it as you consume the building or use the building. And that's kind of the idea. Now you might say, hey, I don't do that. I don't buy that big of stuff, but you still, you have to do the same thing for furniture and fixture vehicles and things like that. And you have to do it at least for taxes, even if you don't want to do it internally for your own bookkeeping purposes, because you're a small business or something, taxes are going to force you to have some things that are going to be recorded and deviate from a cash basis system. So furniture and equipment, large purchases, vehicles, large purchases, buildings, large purchases like that. And we'll talk more about this when we start to record the transactions related to them and so on. Then we're going to have to depreciate it. This is an adjusting journal entry, accumulated depreciation being us decreasing in essence the value of the assets as we consume them over time and then reporting them as an expense in the form of depreciation. So we'll talk more about about that process as we enter data in the future, but that's the general idea. Other uh, assets, these would be non-current assets that also do not fall under the category of fixed assets, such as here the security deposit, usually not a whole lot of things in that category. Then we've got the liabilities. So on the liability side of things, these are things that we owe to a third party, like a bank. So we've got current liabilities and long-term liabilities. These are going to be current liabilities is a standard categorization for financial reporting. But then within it, you've got these three categories here, which again is a little bit kind of unique. It's unique in essence to QuickBooks because they're doing that because again, these accounts have specific needs as we saw with the current assets. Current liabilities as a general uh, category just represents that we owe these liabilities within a year's time frame. It's important to note that because we want to be able to pay them with some liquid assets. That's why we have the cash broken out and then the current assets broken out because the current assets are what we're going to need to hopefully convert to cash soon enough so that we can pay off the debts that are becoming due within the next year, the current liabilities. So we're always comparing the current assets to current liabilities. You can imagine a situation where a company has a whole lot of assets, but they're still having problems with their debt, with their cash flow, because possibly all of their assets are in fixed assets, building equipment. So like a farm, classic example, where they have a lot of, lot of stuff, they have a lot of value, but it might be all not very liquid so they could you could still have cash flow problems because of that and if that's common in many businesses because of course you're the point is you're trying to invest your cash as much as possible in property plants and equipment so that you can use that to generate revenue that's the stuff that generates you the revenue but in any case we've got then the sub accounts accounts payable similar to accounts receivable we saw over here on the chart of accounts that if we go into the liabilities down here, the liabilities, there's the accounts payable. It's got a special need of us breaking it out, not only by date, but also by vendor, by who we, mo who we owe the money to in a similar way as the accounts receivable. That's the one that goes up every time if I go to the home page when we enter the bills. So if we're on an accrual basis method, for the liability side, we'll have to deal with accounts payable. If we're just paying the bills as they come due and using bank feeds possibly to do that or something like that, then we won't, we won't have accounts payable if we're not on an accrual basis system. Then we've got the credit cards. They have to be broken out into a special category because the credit cards are gonna be, if I go back to the chart of accounts, you, you'll notice they have this little, this little icon here, which means they can be connected to the bank. So when we think about bank feeds, we often think just of the cash accounts, but also just realize that the credit cards are going through the financial institutions and therefore you can connect them to the bank in a similar way. And that can be really you know, a beneficial tool. We'll talk more about that in future presentations, but that's why they need to be broken out. And then everything else that doesn't have a special category, but is under current liabilities will then be here, payroll, sales taxes. Then we've got the long-term liabilities, and these would be typically things like loans that are gonna be extending beyond one year. Now also just realize that when you have loans, most of the times the loans will be installment loans that we think about, similar to a mortgage in that they're gonna extend beyond a year, but we pay them off possibly monthly. So if you get technical on it, 
there should be a short-term component to them and a long-term component because we're going to be paying off a year's worth in a year and then we're going to be paying off the rest of it after the year. So how do you deal with that? We'll talk more about that in, when we get to some uh, adjusting entries. But but periodically, periodically you might go in and fix your, your liabilities to break out the short-term and long-term portion of your loans so that you have better comparability between the current liabilities and making sure you have the cash flow to pay off those liabilities by comparing them to the current assets. Okay, and then we've got the equity section, which is often the most confusing uh, section down here, where we've got the, the and the reason it's, let's open, up, let's open up a calendar. The reason it's a calculator, the reason it's confusing is because the equity section could be called different things depending on what kind of entity it is, meaning it'll be called something different or to have different accounts if it's a sole proprietorship versus a partnership versus a corporation. It also has a few things that are a little bit different in QuickBooks than, uh, than you might see in financial reporting. So for example, we've got equity down here. Now the first thing to note is that if it was a, if it was a sole proprietorship, you might call it owner's equity but you can't really change the name of the drop down, right? So you might be thinking, I'd rather call my, my fixed assets property, plants, and equipment. That's not as easy to change that because this, this name right here is driven by the account type field, right? So, so, so it's, it's gonna be under the category driven by the type, the, the account types that we set up here. So that, that's gonna give us some restriction to be able to kind of rename different things and this had to be called something so they called it equity right but if it was a sole proprietorship they might have called it owner's equity if it was a partnership you might think it called partnership equity if it was a corporation possibly shareholders equity here it's just going to all be equity the accounts underneath it we've got the opening balance equity we'll talk about that later you can really think of that as kind of like a, a clearing account it's an account that shouldn't really be there once everything is set up because it's an, it's an account that's basically gonna try to make it as easy as possible to first set up the beginning balances. We'll talk more about that later. So that's an account that's gonna be unique to QuickBooks. You won't see an opening balance equity account on like financial reports typically. And then we've got the capital stock and the retained earnings. Those are names that are typically used for like a corporation. So note that you might have like a sole proprietorship. If it were a sole proprietorship, what you would generally see is one owner's account, which might be called like an, an, a capital account for one owner. Because remember, the equity section represents the value of the company that is attributable to the owners. In other words, it's going to be the assets minus the liabilities. So if I take the total assets here, 640072.33 minus the liabilities, which are coming to total liabilities minus the 420442.73 we come up to the total equity, the 219629.6. Now, if that was just attributable to one owner, then you, have, you can imagine one capital account called owner's equity or something like that. And then the net income would be there because that's kind of like unique to, to QuickBooks. And we'll talk more about that later. The opening balance, if you were to do this more professionally, you would close out the opening balance once you've adjusted everything for the startup process into the capital account, if it was a sole proprietorship, the one capital account. Now, if you have a partnership, you've got two or more people in the equity section. So therefore this total here still represents the amount of the assets that are claimed, not by third party liabilities, the bank, for example, but are attributable to the owner. But then you've got to break out who is there, are they attributable to tracking then further breaking out the partnership by partner two capital accounts or three capital accounts, depending on how many partners you have, that could actually get quite complex because the partnership agreements could be different. The draws and the allocation of income could vary. So they get some complicated situations. The third situation you have then is that it's a corporation, which could be owned by a whole bunch of different people, but the corporation could actually be a little bit easier from the, corp from the bookkeeping standpoint because then we use the term retained earnings and then capital stock, for example, and that would, so we're breaking out the investment, how much we sold the stock for generally, how much the owners put into the company when we sold the stock, and then the retained earnings representing the earnings of the company 
that have accumulated that we have not paid out in dividends. And again, we wouldn't really have an opening balance because we would fix that, which we'll do in the practice problem in a future presentation. The reason it's still pretty easy, even though you have more people potentially even than a partnership, is because of the design of having each of these stocks the same unit of ownership. So instead of us are kind of tracking different capital accounts depending on the partnership agreement, we just we just assign different levels of ownership depending on how many stocks somebody owns, and that makes it kind of standardizes the units, kind of like have, kind of like using cash instead of bartering. Using cash is a lot easier because now you got like this standardization uh, process that that you're kind of using. And then you could like have an S corporation, which is a kind of corporation, so similar, and then a, a limited liability company, which is kind of like a partnership, same kind of thing as a partnership in essence. Okay, then we've got the net income. Now the net income's a little bit weird because normally you wouldn't see net income on the balance sheet. Why does QuickBooks put net income on the balance sheet? Because they're trying to tie the balance sheet to the profit and loss. And so notice that in the double entry accounting system, these two things are tied together if I go to the P&L, then this whole income statement comes down to 119, 154.64. That goes into the balance sheet here. Normally, you wouldn't record it separately. It would just be part of, in this case, retained earnings. It would just be included in retained earnings. In other words, the balance sheet, the equity section here of the balance sheet kind of represents the income statement, or, or in other words, the income statement is, is breaking out the activity of one year's worth of activity to show how we got to the endpoint that we're saying we're at in the balance sheet. So in this case, assets minus liabilities shows a value as of 1231-2024, The income statement is showing us one year back, kind of showing us running the race or driving how many miles we drove, right? from before we started to get here. It's telling us how far we went in terms of net income within a time frame. in this case, the last year. So that can be useful. So, if, so in other words, if I, if I was to change the date up to 25 up top, what's gonna happen when I hit tab, this net income is gonna roll into retained earnings tab. And you see the net income rolled into retained earnings where it really should be. And then I'm gonna bring it back down to 24. Now that's kind of good, but it's kind of a mess at the same time because it only, this is always there on a yearly basis. So if you want to report a monthly report, it can be a little bit confusing because this is net income for the year. And if you're trying to break out between a partnership, like into multiple partner accounts for capital accounts, it could be a little confusing that you've got this net income that's in this other account. So it's, it's kind of nice. It's trying to show you how the things tie out, but it does cause problems at the same time. Okay, so that's the general overview of uh, the balance sheet.